So it's hard to tell if we have our audience. I see only um, three participants, Ooh. which means the three of us. Oh, one has John. Yeah. One person has John. Yep, fine. Okay, oh, we've got our attendees coming in. Hopefully everyone can he uh, hear us. Um, Alan or Helena, can we get you to wave at us so we know that you can hear us? Amir, my, my colleague Amir is also on the line. Wonderful to see people joining. We're going to give it. Uh, we're going to give it another minute or two to have to allow people the opportunity to join in the hope that uh, that they're not having technical difficulties. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah. Who's, who's just someone who's just joined us? Yes, I'm Sami Agri from Algeria. Sami, nice to meet you. Ashante, welcome. How are you doing? We're, we're waiting nice for more people to join the chat room so that we're prepared to begin. Um, and I think Grace is having some technical difficulties, so we want to give her the opportunity to join as well. She was with us. Uh... She was with us mo uh, moments ago. I see we have many participants coming from all, all parts of the world. It's wonderful to see such a diverse group coming to hear about philanthropy at this uh, interesting time. Niritz, I see Grace on my um, list of participants, so she may be online. Um, Grace, I, think she, she, I think she's not. Does she show up as a participant already? She sh she shows as um, as uh, as a sp already on the speaker list. So she seems to have logged. Oh, she just dropped out. She had logged in for about a minute or so. Yeah, we we keep losing Grace. So I want to give her a moment of grace, and we're going to begin momentarily. Um, And we seems to be also losing Sammy. I don't know. Um, something in the in the in the video. Right. We'll, we'll do the best we can. I guess you know. In, in uh, this is an unusual harassment for us. No. Yeah. You, you know, one thing you could do, Nirit, is is when we have communication problem, which happened a lot between China and the rest of the world due to the Great Firewall, we ask <laughs> uh, speakers to uh, shut off the the video. It's not okay. good because. The, but, but at least you focus on the audio, and that's the essence. So um, if we have uh, a slow connection coming from Sami or anyone else, um, if the person turn off the video, it usually is enough to focus on getting at least a good audio. Yes, agreed. Agreed. Um, this is an unusual year for us in general, but... Uh, <laughs> well, we're running... 
compounded by uh, by technical problems. So. Um, but here it, we are learning new skills. I would never thought I would be speaking to you live. Yeah, that's true. Or even a month, you know, months ago, maybe 12 months so, ago. Uh, necessity is the mother of invention for sure. That's right. Um, so we've lost two of our speakers. Hopefully they come back on. Thank you for to all the participants for your uh, kind of patience as we, we cope with some technical problems. Um, now, it's interesting because Andy still on the, is on my screen. Yeah, okay. He's, I can see Andy on my uh, list of participants. We are down to three. <laughs> yes. Um, I, my understanding is that there's been some issues in other sessions as well. Yeah. Uh, yes. So Sami, I think Sami is back with us. So I, I think we're gonna uh, we're we're gonna begin. And um, my suggestion is, uh, as you say, Pierre, that uh, that if people have technical issues with their video, that they will uh, introduce themselves and then perhaps drop off the screen and just do audio so that we can hear, uh, most importantly, what they have to say. So I want to welcome everybody to the uh, session, the harassment session on benefits of uh, managed philanthropy. Uh, sometimes the idea of manage, management and philanthropy don't fall in line uh, as we expect. Um, in, in particular in the uh, coming months, and you'll notice that we have a very diverse panel, uh, which I will let in a moment to introduce themselves, uh, coming from very different parts of the world. Um, I think this is a very unusual time in terms of the behavior of philanthropy. Uh, there have actually been some interesting positive trends in individual and institutional philanthropy that are sparked by the COVID virus. Um, and um, there are some things that we can learn from this pandemic that we may hope to take root and grow um, because COVID in many ways has driven some uh, the sector to rise to its best form in, in in the form of uh, community-based rapid response, um, diagnostics, vaccines, philanthropy is showing up on the one hand to flatten the curve in the short term and also to look at long-term uh, inequities that we hope uh, you know, will, will, uh, will sustain over time. We, we believe that, that the crisis will, uh, will exacerbate certain inequities, and we hope that, uh, that these trends will continue to look at the long term. It's quite striking, the this, this scale of capital that's being committed by major philanthropists, about uh, $10.3 billion globally in May, um, according to uh, sources on grants. Um, the way that it's been giving and is, uh, is has been much faster, with fewer conditions, and in more collaboration with uh, with institutions and corporations working together. About seven corporate uh, public pledge to streamline their grant process, um, and, and they're partnering with their peers to make visible grants with a lot less paperwork. So the, the pandemic is changing the way that people are giving, much more responsive and engaged and nimble. Um, the challenge for us will be to make these things stick and not to be pulled back to what we, we call the uh, old way of working and, uh, and to create a new normal. So um, what I'd like to do with no further ado is to allow our panel each to introduce themselves for two or three minutes in, in terms of what they are doing in the various locations that they are in and um, where their main focus has been and where they see some of the trends uh, going. So Pierre, please, could I ask you to introduce yourself for two, three minutes and tell us a little bit about what you're engaged in and, and uh, where the trends are. I think in your particular case, Pierre, you're in different countries and perhaps can, can help us to move across the globe and talk about how philanthropy differs from place to place. Um, Nerid, thank you, and um, it's really a pleasure to join this panel and to join this uh, global convention. Um, I think that this is one of the benefits of COVID-19. We are learning new tricks and uh, doing new things. Um, my name is Pierre Cohad. I am a Frenchman, as you can hear. I have been uh, living and working in China for the past uh, 16 years, essentially based in Shanghai. I am a, an executive. I'm a senior executive. This is what I have done all my life. This is what I love doing. I've done my, uh, my work at the juncture of consumer goods, 
with company like Kodak and Danone, and then industrial um, with company like Goodyear in tires and Triangle Tire, the largest tire manufacturer in China. And then um, I've now moved to advisory role. I have joined a portfolio of boards. I have built a portfolio of global boards. Um, and, um, and this is what I essentially do from Shanghai. Um, I was fortunate to have a very global career. Um, I worked and lived in uh, many countries, including places such as Brazil and, uh, and Mexico and other places in Asia, such as Singapore, India, um, Europe with Switzerland and a little bit in Japan and the United States. And one thing I noticed as I was going through the world, one thing that really passionate me was education. And the big difference I saw between a country like Brazil and Mexico and other countries around the world was education. Why could the swamps of Singapore become a model city? It was about education and everything that came with it. And so when I came to China in 2004, I focused all of the philanthropic activities of Goodyear towards education. And China as a state-based, state-led organization called Project Hope that built school in partnership with businesses. So a business will provide 50% of the funds and then the, um, the, the, uh, the association, the organization Hope will provide another 50%. So good you started to build many schools around the country and we were using our employees, our suppliers, our customers to start contributing to those schools. And as I was going around these schools, I noticed one thing. Those, those were amazing buildings, great teachers, fantastic students, but no English. And the reason I can speak to you today is because I speak English. And I believe that English is the password to the world. And so I started a personal project, which was that in every school that Goodyear contributed to build, there will be an English lab. There will be computers and teachers teaching English to the kids, and there will be internet access because the other key to the world is internet access. Even if you have a great firewall like China does, internet access is the key to the world. So I started to personally fund English teachers, English labs, and internet access in those schools. And as I was doing that, I realized that I needed to be a lot more effective about how the funds were being used. I will be doing fundraising among my friends. I will be having events. But eventually, there is only so much resources I have. So I started to look at how can I be a lot more efficient and consequently look for the best product, the best system, the best solution to deliver more to this community. And as I was doing that, um, I had the chance of meeting um, Mr. Jamil, uh, Mohamed Jamil. And, and he's, a, he's a very talented, very successful Saudi businessman. He owns, he's the largest Toyota distributor in the world, in fact. And he has created at the MIT a lab called the uh, Poverty Action Lab, uh, the ALA, ALG Poverty Action Life Lab, which is led by Esther Duflo. Esther Duflo is an American French woman. Um, she has specialized all of her career on essentially fighting poverty um, 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 with science, with, um, with, with metrics. Uh, I think she was recognized recently with the Nobel Prize. But Esther Duflo is the heart of this lab that um, Mr. Jamil created some, some years ago in 2003. And that has inspired me. That has inspired me because what I was trying to do very modestly in China, uh, Esther Duflo and the 170 professors around the world working with S in Esther's network, and Mr. Jamil were doing it in a much, much larger scale. And this is why I fundamentally believe that businesses with their governance, their metrics, the discipline we bring can really make a difference by taking the existing resources and stretching it to higher efficiency. And I will pause right there. Over to you, Nuri. Thank you. Thank you, Pierre. And we're going to ask you a little bit about those metrics uh, a little later. And I, I do want to also uh, encourage people, as you have questions, to please put them in the question box so that we make sure to uh, address your questions along the way. Um, Sami, could we go along to you to maybe give us a few words of introduction about what you're doing and how things are changing and uh, hear a little bit about your work? Just I'll encourage you to take you off the mute button because at the moment you're muted. 
Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, invitation and for this occasion. I will try to do my best with my English. Uh, I am Sami Agli. I am CEO of uh, Family Group, which is uh, investing in uh, several sectors, uh, uh, real estate, and food industry, agriculture, services. And also uh, today I am here uh, with the role of uh, the president of the main uh, entrepreneur organization in Algeria, which is the main patronat, uh, uh, Confédération Algérienne du Patronat Citoyen, or Algerian Confederation of uh, uh, Citizen Patronage. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, honorable assistants, uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, or as this extraordinary meeting organi organizers for inviting our entrepreneur organization uh, in order to discuss current economy and social uh, themes, uh, particularly with regards uh, to the global pandemic and the related in economic crisis. In order to uh, uh, revert to our panel theme uh, about advantages of managed philanthropy, I would like to point out the, to the audience that if philanthropy or corporate sponsorship has continued to grow in Europe and in the United States these past few years and supported by foundation there are that are related to our appendages of these companies. This is not the case in Africa and especially in Algeria where sponsorship is still in a non-bryonic stage and has not created yet institutions of this kind, which in other countries, especially especially, especially in wine range of fields. As you already know, philanthropy refers to arts and letters adversity through commissions of financial aid given by a philanthropist who can be a person or an organization such as the companies or uh, like our uh, organization. In, la in larger sense, it can also be applied to any general interest area as research, education, environment, sport, solidarity, innovation, etc. At the heart of philanthropy, corporate sponsorship continues to develop and is characterized as financial, human, and material support provided by a company without any direct benefits and also a form of support provided by some business leaders, particularly the wealthiest, thank thanks to their generosity. Philanthropy stands out from sponsorship. Sponsorship has a non-philanthropic aim and, and therefore becomes a commercial aim, a form of marketing, if you will. Many Algerian companies have dedicated an interest page, their philanthropy sponsorship action or action they intend to carry out in this field. Ladies and gentlemen, we have observed in Algeria in recent years larger company, including mobile phones operator, banks, financial, industrial ad, or in-kind operations, granted in favor of cultu cultural and artistic projects. These are fields where philanthropists do not dare to venture out, having always been interested in initiative around health, sports, development, or financing the construction of wor worship places. Regarding our, our uh, organization, our members, our, our economic here in Algeria, our companies as economic actors are fully committed to the success of our country economic mission and participate on a regular basis in action of solidarity toward people who are the most in need. The most edifying example of, uh, of their solidarity, despite economic difficulty they are going through, is their unprecedented mobilization which is still undergrowing in all of the country throughout the COVID-19 health crisis. By their involvement in thousands of, thousands of solidarity operations for the benefit of patients, doctors, hospitals, simply peoples. These actions are reflected through their financial support to the national funds talking coronavirus, including the production and distribution of hospital products, foods, equipment, disinfection operation, providing several support. Similarly, we, through our uh, companies, social and civic commitment have organized in uh, this year, last February especially, uh, for the benefits of the Algerian Federation of Disabled People, a, a, a huge gala, whose stems was integration of disabled people in the workplace. This was a great success. 
in terms of numbers of inequality uh, and the quality of don donor contributors members. As it achieved its objective, furthermore, our organization is committed to encouraging our thousands of members company on the need to open at least one workstation for the benefit of person with specific needs. Ladies and gentlemen, my country, Algeria, is, an economic, is in economic transition. I would add that this pandemic is an accelerating factor of the transformation of our economic model hitherto based in oil and gas. It is also in the perspective of the diversification that huge reforms, a regulatory framework has just involved in favor of entrepreneurship in general and international foreign, uh, foreign investors. Ladies and gentlemen, Algeria is speeding up its opening. This vision is clear and the course is set. It has all the assets necessary for the transformation of its economic paradigm. His well-formed and very committed youth, as everyone knows, they amaze the world, the whole world with her sense of responsibility and her value. So welcome to all of you in Algeria. And finally, I am at your disposal to during, the, during this dedicated uh, period uh, to debate or to answer to, uh, to answer of your question. Thank you for your attention and I wish you all the success to the work of our panel. Thank you very much. Thank you for your lovely remarks, Sami. Um, I'm learning so much just from listening to your introductory remarks, everyone, in uh, areas of the world that I haven't had the pleasure to work in. I think Grace is back on and perhaps we'll give Grace the opportunity, even if Grace uh, would like to stay off screen, Perhaps she can join us with audio and give us some uh, words of introduction, or did we just lose her again? We'll be back to Grace. Uh, Kim, thanks for your patience, my friend, in Australia. Um, could you give us a few words of introduction on what you're doing, where you see the trends? Uh, and then we'll, we'll begin with some questions. I want to remind the audience, please, um, to contribute any questions or thoughts that are on your mind that you can, uh, we can ask our distinguished panelists. Please, Kim. Thanks, Nerit, and uh, thanks for uh, for organising this. As Nerit has said, uh, I'm uh, from Australia. I founded and and run a uh, a business, uh, a finance business that uh, specialises in supply chain finance. Um, what I had thought uh, for uh, tonight, still tonight, depending where you are tonight here, early morning, I think in in uh, in uh, Los Angeles. I uh, thought there were a couple of uh, points that that uh, I could mention that uh, intended to uh, intending to uh, provoke some discussion and some some questions. Um, in the past, philanthropy has often been seen as just giving money, um, and I think we need to discuss uh, uh, how it can be measured whether there is a critical success in it. Philanthrop philanthropy is no longer just a measure of, measure of goodwill. And secondly, that philanthropy needs to be less transactional and more transformative. That if there's going to be a philanthropic program, there needs to be measured results and outcomes. And we need to think about how that, how that works in different cultures. Um, as to philanthropy being no longer just a, a gesture of goodwill, with globalisation, it's allowed multinational countries to be as powerful as some nation states and some political systems due to their size and the and the impact and the effect they have on supply chains and the employment of thousands, if not millions of people. This means that to some extent there's a bit of a friction between larger corporations and 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 and, uh, and nations. Corporate philanthropy, corporate charity has the ability to drive innovation, brand differentiation and longevity for the organization. I think that that the charitable efforts of any business, any corporation need to be less transactional and more transformative. Uh, more of a focus on, on capital and capital being not just money but time, manpower and skills. Um, this has come to the fore during the COVID thing. There's a, there's a wealthy businessman in Australia. You may have heard of him, Andrew Forrest. He's a billionaire. And he did more to bring in uh, uh, the needs to address the uh, COVID and the pandemic situation than the government was able to do. And he did it in a fraction of the time, did it out of his own pocket without any expectation of repayment. Um, and he did that by leveraging not just his capital, but more particularly his contacts that he'd developed over years and years in business 
particularly in China. In a business, we need to encourage employees to be more engaged uh, so that if they see uh, firsthand the, dif- the disadvantage and the issues at play and get some sense of satisfaction and fulfilment out of contributing to that, that it makes their satisfaction and their job more significant. We need to be able to measure outcomes. And in, if you look historically, uh, there's been too much emphasis on how much money did you raise, how much did you donate, how much did you get from that drive, and no uh, focus on what was the outcome, what did you achieve, what were the results. And I know that my focus comes from being in business and the businesses that I interact with, but more and more, uh, whether it's our business or other businesses, we're interested and more focused on specific, measurable, achievable and relevant time-based goals, that there's a result. Having a list of tangible ways in which your company or your business or your group of employees have been able to assist is more significant than how much money did you raise or how much money did you donate. Philanthropy can be a marketing tool, and that was uh, mentioned earlier in relation to sponsorship, Um, but it can also be a way of engaging better with your customers, engaging better with your employees, and getting more concrete and real results, not just philanthropically, but uh, in your business. And f- and the last thing I, I'd suggested that we, we consider is what motivates different cultures as far as charity and philanthropy is concerned. Because in some cultures, I think there's still a status thing that uh, I feel a sense of satisfaction or status out of having written a large check without any sense of what the end result really was. Um, I think some people are driven by tax concessions, I really do. And, but some people, and what we really need to tap into, are those that really want to affect change and really if, really put in place uh, the betterment of mankind. So there's some thoughts that uh, I'd like to throw in that uh, maybe some discussion will flow from that. You need to unmute. Thank you. Um, thanks for that. I, you know, you've already inspired many questions. I think you've, you've opened many more questions than have been answered, uh, for me at least. I took lots of notes and I'm sure there are others. Grace, I'm so glad to see you with us. Welcome. Can we Thank give you, you, you introduce? I, I got, um, well, I got a uh, problem with the internet. But it, it, if you find, if you have the, if you have trouble with the video, you're welcome at some point to uh, to go to audio. The important thing for us now is to hear a little bit about the work that you're doing. So you introduce yourself, uh, where you're putting your efforts, where your efforts are going, whether they're changing in trends, how they're impacting your country, and how that may be different from others. So please, uh, Grace, a few moments of uh, opening, and then I'll, I'll introduce myself, yeah. and we'll open questions. Thank you. Thanks for being Thank here. You. Thank you. Um, actually, um, I'm the CEO of um, Global Business Services. Global Business Services is actually a holding company um, uh, with subsidiaries um, ranging from um, uh, trade and investment, event management, publishing company, etc. Uh, but in 2015, I found um, I'm I become the founder of Ambassador and CEO Club. Um, it is not. Um, uh, like financial club or uh, other business clubs uh, that um, we usually people involved in, but it is um, an initiative involving ambassadors um, from uh, different embassies here in Jakarta, uh, Indonesia, and CEOs from private sector and NGOs um, to strengthen people to people relations between Indonesia and uh, other countries. Um, the idea is to work together um, hand in hand to create good impact for people um, in Indonesia. Uh, we just celebrated our fifth uh, anniversary. Um, and um, during uh, five years, the past five years, um, we were involved in um, quite uh, uh, many, I mean, uh, different different uh, charity uh, programs. Um, uh, for example, um, we have a three-year project with Jakarta government to develop around 200 uh, child-friendly community centers in uh, Jakarta. This is the first initiative uh, never been before in Indonesia. And uh, we help uh, also like Habitat for Humanity, building uh, small houses uh, for underprivileged families. Um, And then uh, together with some uh, ambassadors, uh, we raised funds for Sumba. Uh, I wrote books with... um, uh, 
I wrote books with um, 18 peoples of 16 nationalities, including 14 ambassadors, and all proceeds uh, go to charity. And um, actually, there are so many um, different initiatives that uh, we've done so far. Uh, the idea is like this. If we do it alone, sometimes uh, it is it is uh, the big uh, the impact is not as big if we uh, come together. And uh, this is like the first initiative in our country to um, involve not only private sector and NGOs, but also embassies, uh, foreign embassies. Um, sometimes um, they don't have uh, enough funding. But the thing is like this. Um, for example, for example, if uh, the ambassador of Germany take part in this uh, in the initiative, then the private sectors like Mercedes or Lufthansa uh, or other brands from uh, from that uh, uh, countries will support. Uh, also, uh, for example, the ambassador of uh, United States, if uh, he is involved in this uh, initiative. Then the uh, the the private sector uh, from United States, like uh, for example uh, Google or um, anything from uh, United States, they will support us in um, uh, in this uh, initiative. So um, actually, this is uh, what I'm sharing here. Uh, we can usually uh, uh, not usually, but we can actually involve embassies not uh, asking for their money, but asking for their influence um, to, um, you know, to encourage uh, the private sectors to, um, to be involved uh, in, our, uh, in this uh, charity programs. I think uh, that's for now. Thank you, Grace. Um, I guess we lost uh, Michael Carlos along the way, who I hope will join us at some point from Switzerland. Uh, my name is Nirit Harel. I come from the Israeli high-tech uh, startup environment, which seems, uh, some, seems, I guess, in this context not to have any relevance, but, uh, but has quite a bit of relevance in my own personal journey. Um, over the last about uh, 12 to 15 years, I've been taking the skills that I learned from the flat structures and very nimble uh, associations and uh, growing uh, associations to apply uh, business skills to the philanthropic and nonprofit landscape. So I, I think uh, somewhere along the way, I, I uh, realized that there were many in um, the startup environment and the nonprofit sectors things uh, like uh, diminishing funds, um, constantly struggling for, for money, short time to market entry, uh, poorly managed teams sometimes with a great passion, um, and that if we could take what I had learned in the corporate environment about growing companies and being more efficient, that uh, we really could help uh, these kinds of nonprofits and charitable ventures or um, I like to say purpose-driven uh, ventures rather than charitable. Um, that we could really make a lot of good because, you know, we have a misnomer, uh, at least in the American uh, landscape, um, of, you know, the term of nonprofit, which uh, nonprofit is a tax status. It's not a business uh, model. And, and it's often confused, as I think uh, Kim alluded to, uh, with, with, with diminishing funds and losing money where we need to sometimes perform even better in those kinds of environments in order to make the funds last. So uh, Impact, which is my business as a marketing consultancy in New York um, that uh, used to focus on technology and is now uh, more and more focusing on the impact space and uh, nonprofits. And I, I think that it pays at some point for us to talk about a little bit what the difference between impact and, and corporate social philanthropy and um uh, you know, and, and some of these other things might be because I spent a lot of my time talking about triple bottom line and people plan and profit uh, that, that we need to be doing all of the three. Uh, so I, we have a presence in New York, a presence in uh, Israel and a presence in Portugal now as well. Beginning stages of helping to accelerate um, ventures in the impact space. So um, from, from, uh, from that point, what I'd like to do a little bit is to follow up with questions that were inspired by some of your uh, comments. Um, maybe I'll start with Pierre. I think you have some opinions about this particular subject, but I'd love for everyone to reflect. Whose job is it 
I mean, when you look at philanthropy, and uh, and I'll tell you, you know, I'll, I'll 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 preface this with another thing. You know, in, in the culture that I come from, the word for for for, for charity is staka, and the word staka actually means justice. And what it alludes to is that you know, uh, charity is not something that we or philanthropy is not something that's viewed as a. Uh, you know, um, a luxury or something that you can choose to do as a favor to somebody else, but that it's expected to happen. Um, justice is something that's ex expected of everybody. It's a basic need, right? So, uh, you know, Pierre, with that in mind, whose whose job is it to to uh, to solve these problems and and to to engage in? Well, uh, um, there's no easy solution, right? But um, you have two different type of environment. You have environments such as China, where the states or the party will have a very strong role to play. And you have, um, I would say, the more um, Western uh, liberal democracy, where it's a combination between the leadership of the philanthropy and the donors. So if I make a donation to a philanthropy, you can bet that I'm going to be very interested to make sure that I know how that resources is being used. And if I can harness additional resources or additional support for that uh, for that cause, I will do so. Um, if you look at environments such as China, you cannot be successful in China unless you align your activities and your cause with the priority of the government, which means the priority of the party. And and I don't want to get into a lot of debate on that, but this is a country that has lifted a billion people out of poverty in 20 years. And so when they tell us we know what we are doing, uh, we can always say we can improve it a little bit on the margin, but they have a billion case uh, to um, help us understand um, uh, what they have done. So, so, so in the case of China, I have always aligned uh, the activities I have sponsored to organize with the Chinese authorities, and um, this is why I was using the Hope Foundation. Um, and then, um, uh, in addition to the Hope Foundation, I was adding my own twist around teaching English. Uh, but I will do that always with the support of the local authority, because eventually um, I'm a guest in the country, and, and as a guest, I need to respect my host. Pierre, has that? Uh, what do you see in terms of the differences? Then, I mean, uh, from the many places that you've lived, as a follow-up question, you know, in terms of the role of government and the responsibility of government uh, versus philanthropic uh, institutions or individuals. Um, has, has that trend been different from the various places? That well, I, I think that China and a few other Asian countries are really exceptions. If you think about the strong governance that you may have in places like Singapore or for that matter, Taiwan or obviously uh, uh, China, uh, there is a role of the state which is recognized and, and, and has been very good. Generally speaking, around the world, I think that I think that businesses and individual and churches, or maybe not churches, I should say, religious uh, foundation have to step in. Uh, and what I mean by that is I'm, I'm obviously highly concerned by the level of debt that Western democracy and many other countries are currently piling up in order to uh, mitigate the consequence of COVID-19. These are money that they could barely borrow, will probably not be able to pay back, and eventually will be taken away from social programs or future social programs. So if I look at coming years, I think that whether it is businesses, which often right now have an expectation of becoming an exemplary citizen, whether it is the affluence citizen of a given country, or whether it is religious foundation, I believe that those forces will have a greater role to play and they need to harness the power of science, of metrics, of proven methodology, so that whatever resources they have, they can do more with those resources and more effectively. Thank you. Grace, what are you learning from the current uh, situation or, you know, in terms of the changes and trends um, and, and how, how is giving or, or the needs changed and what do you hope to take from it that maybe we'd like to sustain um, after COVID, um, if you have an opinion there? Well, it's not easy now uh, because, uh, you know, um, we... Ambassador and CEO Club usually is funded by the private sector, and the private sector now is suffering. Uh, we are we all suffering because of the uh, the pandemic. Um, so um, 
some of our uh, initiatives uh, are now uh, postponed. And um, well, I hope that it can come back again next year uh, stronger. Um, and uh, but now um, with the funding that we have uh, got, um, we try to uh, change um, the target. Uh, the target is now uh, for the COVID uh, affected um, uh, uh, project like that. Uh, so. Um, uh, yeah we change we change uh, the target and um uh, from the consensus it is okay so yeah so we do it like that thank you and sami uh, a similar question um you know we 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 see some changes in trends of of giving and receiving during these months uh, of uh of covid and change and i'm wondering how you and Al algeria and how how things there have changed in terms of uh the trends and whether there are things that you're learning that you'd like to keep are, are things changing are there anything that's changing that you'd like to preserve and that you hope will continue after the crisis uh Yes, sorry, I have some uh, problem with the connection, so I maybe I switch off my camera to uh, heard me better. No uh, yes, uh, 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 in Algeria, of course, uh, I think we lived this uh, last month uh, uh, a special, uh, I think, experience because, of course, uh, we ask uh, uh, as uh, first of all as a citizen and for uh, as a, uh, investor and as a entrepreneurship uh, entrepreneur. Uh, how we can be useful to our uh, uh, country, how we can be useful to our community uh, in this uh, special uh, uh, period, which is a, a world uh, situation. Uh, it's not special for us. So uh, uh, each company, each people, each uh, citizen, each uh, CEO, you know, mobilize his uh, um, uh, know-how, his uh, of course, uh, financing operation, financing, uh, uh, supporting hospitals, supporting doctors. And I think it is normal. This is uh, maybe another way of philanthropy. We know philanthropy until now that we give money to finance uh, 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 cultural or uh, uh, things uh, uh, similar. Uh, now, I think uh, maybe I think. The, the philanthropy will change in the future. You know, with the, this pandemic experience, I think things is moving uh, 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 autrement, uh, another way. Uh, and uh, we are sure that uh, that uh, uh, we will see more uh, uh, people helping uh, each other. And uh, uh, the, the, as a company, as a CEO of company, I think we we, we must uh, over. Uh, all uh, consideration we, we we must be useful really useful for our community i think this is the main goal we can call it philanthropy we can call it uh, uh, you know we can use a lot of words but i think in the end we really must be useful for our community uh, each one can do it uh, with uh, uh, at, uh, at his, his way but i think all of us we are here uh, sure that uh, we mess uh, at the end uh, the result must be really useful for m someone else terrific so it's really a uniting force we have only a minute and a half to go unfortunately we started a bit late but uh, i want to throw you a little curveball kim and ask you to talk a little bit about what what how do we know that it's working when you talk about results, uh, you know we, we you don't want to talk about what's going in you want to talk about what's coming out you said that pretty decisively how do we know how do we know it's working We need you to unmute. <clears throat> yeah, sorry, took me a while to get that. Uh, Pierre and Sammy said things that, that really uh, struck a, a chord with me. Um, in its simplest terms, you know it's working when there's no longer a need. Um, that sounds uh, overly trite, yeah. overly cute, but that's, that's what it is. Pierre, what you said about the amount of debt that's being racked up at the moment is so right. Um, I said when this started, it's really easy to stop an economy, but I don't think anyone knows how hard it's going to be to restart. And we see that here every day. Um, it got nothing to do with charity, but as an example, my older son's a, a Qantas pilot, and they've a lot of them have been stood down. And they've got to the point where they have difficulty keeping enough pilots current 
to be able to retrain pilots to bring them back online. That's a cost of millions of dollars. And as a as a travelling a member of the travelling public, I want them to be safe. I want them to be well trained. And that's just a tiny little bit. But in answer to your question, I think we've run out of time anyhow, but you know you've succeeded when there's no longer a need. Um, the comment about whether they're churches or religious organisations, one thing that concerns me in Australia is that so many of them have become subcontractors to government. That you, know, that you can say that if you want to turn a dollar into 50 cents, just channel it through the government. And Narette, what you said about, about uh, working in startups and you know, doing more with less. So it's those private organisations that can do more with less. Um, but, yeah, I think we've run out of time. I don't know that anyone's still listening to us. Uh, on, on that note, in fact, we'll just uh, tie up. But I think uh, we're all the, the one thing we are learning as a global community is how it all brings us together. And together we're stronger yes. and that we should continue on this panel and in other places to support each other and to do the right thing and to continue to do more with less. So thank you, everyone, for joining us. It's uh, 2 a.m. in uh, Los Angeles. I'm going to get it some rest, but it's been a real pleasure meeting all of you, and thank you for your inspiration. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.